on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series. Today, we are pleased to present Sue Burha. Sue is Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the, Atlantic, excuse me, at the Atlanta History Center, where she has worked since 2008. She manages the center's oral history initiatives, including the Veterans History Project, a collection of over 800 oral history interviews of veterans from World War II to the Global War on Terror. Uh, she is the curator of more than self, Living the Vietnam War, an exhibition of oral histories, photographs, documents, and artifacts from Vietnam veterans and civilians who served in their support. The exhibit was on display at the Atlanta History Center in 2017-2018 and is now available online. Sue creates and presents regularly scheduled genealogy workshops and programs and provides archives orientation tours for public schools, university students, and faculty. In 2015, the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, also known as NATAS, Southeast Chapter awarded her an Emmy for her contribution in the development of 37 Weeks, Sherman on the March, which aired on Georgia Public Broadcasting. She is a graduate of Brigham Young University and the University of West Georgia. In today's presentation, she will be sharing with us the genealogical materials available at the Atlanta History Center. So I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Sue. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me, Sue. I really appreciate you asking me to do this. And I'm listening to your announcements. I'm blown away by the um, level of support that you provide. It's, you, you've got a great thing going here. So thank you very much for asking me to join you today. And thank you all for um, joining us virtually. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, so what we're going to do today is just what Sue said. We're going to talk a little bit about what the Atlanta History Center has in terms of genealogical holdings. Um, but we're also going to talk a little bit more about that in the broader context of conducting research in Georgia and conducting research in the Southeast and really anywhere um, in the country. We'll talk a little bit about what's available online, but what you, you sort of unavoidably have to actually uh, physically go someplace to be able to access. So having said that much, I'm going to go ahead and cut my camera off if that's okay with you all so that you won't see me peering at the screen. Um, so what I'd like to start with today is how can the Atlanta History Center help you? Um, I've been here at the History Center since 2008. Um, I'm a recovering middle school teacher. Um, I taught middle school uh, here in Georgia for about six years, um, a million years ago, um, and sort of found the History Center by accident when I was taking part in a teaching grant, a federally funded teacher's grant. Um, and was just amazed by the resources that are available here. So this has kind of been my dream job um, in my declining years, you might say. I've been here since 2008, started as a reference manager, and then um, since then moved into a, a few other things as colleagues of mine moved into other things. Um, and now I'm director of oral history and genealogy. So um, what can we do to help you? And the first thing that I wanted to mention that we can do to help you is um, you can search our collection in your pajamas. Um, that's one of the, sorry, I'm dealing a little bit with uh, a few tech issues here, trying to figure out where to place this, where it won't uh, cause too much trouble. But um, anyway, um, we, like most repositories across the country, have been trying really hard to um, put as much content available online, as much as we possibly can online. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about those things today. And then, like I said, we'll mention um, some of the other resources that are available out there, both online and on the web, uh, to help you with your Georgia research. So without further ado, um, you can find us on the web at atlantahistorycenter.com. And this is our landing page. It's atlantahistorycenter.com, not .org, so you do want to make sure that you, you get that straight. atlantahistorycenter.com, and then up here you're going to see this little hamburger um, up in the top right corner, and when you click on that to expand that, this is the screen that will pop up, and you're going to be looking for learning and research, and the very top selection there is search our collection. So that's the first place that you're going to go. When you click on search our collections, this is the screen that you'll see. Now, full disclosure, we are very, very excited about this part of our website. It's brand new. This um, search page, it has only been live for a couple of weeks now. 
Um, and it's very unique to us. I think it's unique to many repositories. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. What we tried to do was pull all of our collections into a single search engine. So you can search for books, for manuscript materials, for photographs, for maps, for museum objects and artifacts, all in one centralized location. So this is a really cool feature. That's the good news. The bad news is because it's so new, I'm still making friends with it. So I hope you'll forgive me if I stumble uh, just a little bit. Um, but this is the main search page. And you can search, as it says here, by keyword, by topic, by neighborhood. And then what we've done to make it even easier is we created a few popular queries. So most of our patrons here at the Atlanta History Center archives, the Keenan Research Center specifically, most of our patrons fit into one of three categories. They are either scholars uh, doing work for to publish um, for, for whatever reason on a variety of topics. Our collection strengths include the civil rights movement, um, uh, military history, particularly the Civil War, um, historic home and neighborhoods, uh, business history about the city of Atlanta, business and commercial history. Um, so most of our patrons are either scholars doing research or they're folks that are either trying to research their historic home or their historic neighborhood or they're folks trying to research their family history. So we tried to kind of think about those most popular queries that our patrons would have and sort of uh, stacked the deck in their favor, so to speak, by creating a query that would sort of already be answered. So you can see over here at the bottom right, there's actually a genealogy query, because again, many of our patrons, that's what they're looking for. So if you click on that genealogy query, this is what you come up with. You can get back to our search the collections page, or you can scroll down here and find a little bit about our genealogical holdings. And then there's some direct links to some of the most um, useful collections that we have pertaining to family history. And then you've got a little bit more down here about kind of how to do it and other places to go. And we're going to talk about a lot of these as we move through the presentation today. Um, and then additional related searches having to do with family history um, on the History Center's webpage. And then again, some more blog posts. Um, if, you, if you click on the load more button, again, we're still populating this, uh, but right now it'll take you to um, the next workshop that I have going because I do I do, do uh, quarterly genealogical workshops here at the Atlanta History Center. So we're kind of excited about this possibility with this federated or, or combined um, search page. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as, we, as we go through the presentation today. So let me find my PowerPoint again, pardon me. Um, the flagship, the sort of the traditional flagship of our genealogical holdings here is a collection known as Garrett's Necrology. Um, Franklin Garrett was a lawyer for the Coca-Cola company by trade, um, but he was a also a family historian. And in the 1930s, 1940s-ish, um, he went around and surveyed over 700 metropolitan Atlanta cemeteries, literally walking up and down uh, the rows of the cemeteries, copying down what was on the headstones, and then taking that back and uh, uh, cross-referencing it with um, uh, obituaries from the newspapers and with City of Atlanta death records. So there's a couple of reasons why this collection is significant. Number one, um, you can see by this image right here, this is taken from the collection, um, Franklin Garrett violates my first rule of genealogical research is, which is um, they surveyed the village and whoever had the worst handwriting was typically either made the census taker or the village priest. You can see Franklin Garrett does not fit that mold. He has the most beautiful printing. Um, don't you wish that every census taker had printing like that? Um, so that's one part of it is terribly easy to read. Uh, the other part of it is these are um, surveys that he did back in the 30s. Many of these cemeteries, the headstones are no longer legible. In some cases, the cemeteries have fallen into disrepair and you couldn't find the graves if you had to. So these surveys can be very, very, very handy um, for researching folks who lived and died in Atlanta between about 1857 and about the 1930s. 
Um, the other reason why this is so important, uh, let me just show you another image. Uh, this is a sample of a uh, obituary abstract. And in the days before we had wide access to online newspapers, this was really helpful because uh, what he would do is he would find the obituary in either the Atlanta Journal or the Atlanta Constitution and just do an abstract of it. So the images that you see on this screen were all taken from the microfilm. So hold that in mind because I'm going to tell you why that's a little different in just a minute. Uh, but the other thing that I wanted to mention about why this collection is so important is um, this is an example right here of a City of Atlanta death certificate abstract. Now, why is that significant? Well, in Georgia, those of you who've done research in Georgia will know, vital records were not required. Civil vital records were not required in Georgia until 1919. 1919 that's very late in the game and many counties were not in full compliance until well into the 20s um so the fact that there are city um uh, uh death certificates that he could abstract um is pretty significant so this is great information again uh for folks who have people who lived and died in atlanta during that time period um so this was from these images that you're seeing now are from the microfilm. We were very lucky in uh, uh, 2013 um, to attract the attention of Family Search, who came here and digitized a ton of our city and county records um, that had genealogical value. So they digitized Garrett's necrology, but instead of going to the microfilm, they went to his original books which is fantastic. And I'll show you an example of that. Well, here, I can do that right now. So if you look at this image right here, this is from the microfilm, but this right here is the original book. So they didn't do it from the microfilm. They took his little books that he took out with him when he did these cemetery surveys and they digitized everything from the books, which is just really cool. Um, and apparently family search is frozen here temporarily, so I'm not getting to show you, um, but we can we can talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, but anyway, they are uh, digitized from the, um, the books themselves rather than the microfilm, which is really cool for us and enables researchers to have a much better experience when they're trying to read these older records. So these images are available at no cost through Family Search. All you need is a, a Family Search account and you can access them. The one thing that you need to keep in mind, though, with all of these records from the Atlanta History Center is not all of them have been indexed yet. So if we have time at the end of my presentation, I'll kind of show you how to navigate that. You just want to keep that in mind. Um, I chatted with Family Search a few years ago, and they gave me a list of what's already been indexed and published, what they intend to index, and what they have no plans to index. Um, but just because there are no plans to index the Campbell County Inferior Court Records does not mean that you can't get those. You can get those right now. You just have to do a little bit of wayfinding, and we can talk about that a little bit later um, in the presentation. So Garrett's Necrology is a pretty cool resource. The downside of it is he focused on, if you'll pardon my expression, dead white guys, right? Um, he, he focused on white men who died between 1857 and about 1932. Women are mentioned quite often, in fact, all the time in the necrology, but only as surviving family members. So the person's wife or daughter or niece or you know whatever um, would be mentioned. Um, in the microfilmed Garrett's necrology, there are no African-American burial records, but they did, he did do African-American burials, some, um, and those are on family search. Those have been digitized and are available on family search. So um, Garrett's necrology does have value for those of you that are looking for, for you know, those ancestors that fit that criteria. Um, and that can be a hugely helpful resource for you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and let me nip back to our website here right quick. Um, if you look at this, again, genealogy page here, um, these, so here's Garrett's Necrology, which we kind of talked about, but there are two other collections that are available here that a lot of folks kind of forget that we have. And both of them, if you look at these dates, 1885 to 1888 and 1896, if you've been doing genealogy for any time at all, you know very well that that 1890 federal census 
doesn't exist for all intents and purposes. There are some fragments available, but the 1890 census was burned. And in many cases, you know, the, the trail sort of stops there. You have this big gap between 1880 and 1900. These two sources can definitely fill some of that gap. So the way this would work, if you wanted to see the Atlanta city census, which was created in 1896, and this is a really easy record group to use because it's typewritten. So if you click on that link right there, um, you can search it if you want to um, using a, you know, a, a person's name. Let me just type in Smith because I know there's going to be some Smiths in the record. Um, and then click on the image here. Um, this is what the 1896 census looks like, and it's fabulous. It's a typewritten record. It's divided by Ward in Atlanta. Um, so this, I'm trying to see if they, yeah, here you go. So you've got first ward, second ward, you know, first through sixth ward. Um, and if, even if you don't know what ward your ancestor lived in, it's really not hard to do. What you end up doing is the 21st century version of the old scrolling through microfilm. So these records are alphabetically, um, organized. So if I'm looking for someone whose surname begins with, you know, F maybe, I can skip through that and I'm up to the H's now. So, you know, you just go back a few pages to try to find someone with an F surname, but you can very quickly um, go through here and see and find your ancestor, regardless of what ward they happen to be living in. And you can see that it provides a name, a current street address, an age, a sex, uh, an F, well, a, a race in that time period, it would have been a race, um, and then a place of birth. Um, so these can be hugely helpful records and again can kind of help to fill in some of those gaps uh, between the, the um, um, 1880 and 1890 census. And then the other part here is this census of white and colored citizens, um, which is what they would have called it in 1885 and 1888. And again, same thing. You can kind of do the 21st century of just sort of scrolling through. Um, this part of the of the census covers um, white citizens during that time period, but you've got a number of children, how many male children, how many female children, uh, how many kids between six and 18 years, male and female. And then if you go to the other side of the page, um, it has things like um, the taxes that were paid, uh, what year, um, you know, uh, Street taxes, I think, is is what this was for, because this would have been a, a city of Atlanta document. Um, so some pretty cool information that you can gather um, from those records that are, again, uh, available on Family Search. So this is the 1896 census right here. Um, and then we're sort of spanning over here. I included this because I wanted to make sure you knew it was here. But these these records over here have not yet been digitized. We are a repository for the city of Atlanta. This, the records don't belong to us, but we um, we preserve them and make them accessible to patrons. And these are Atlanta City Council minutes. And we have those dating back to, oh golly, I think it's 1847 um, is the earliest, or maybe 1855, from the very beginning of the city of Atlanta. Um, and they can provide all kinds of information. There's uh, information in there when people wanted to apply for a business license, for liquor licenses, for all kinds of, of uh, information can be found in these um, city and county records. Um, so that's something that can be helpful too. And then I wanted to mention we've got a huge collection of both manuscript and photographs. Now, the lion's share of these collections, and this is only one, this is a, a, a part of one of our stack areas, and it's a part of only one of five stack areas that we have. Um, so there's an awful lot of material here, archival material here. The vast majority of it has not been digitized, but we're doing everything we can, like all repositories are, um, to seek grant funding and other sources of income, other sources of funding, um, to be able to digitize and make accessible uh, these records. Um, if you are researching Civil War ancestors, we might maybe have you covered because back in 2012, 
We were um, lucky enough to secure uh, grant funding for an NHPRC grant, a federal grant back in 2012. We partnered with several other institutions in Georgia and we digitized about 30,000 pages of our Civil War related manuscripts. So you've got some amazing gems and I, these are a couple that I like to show whenever I get teachers in here because they're just kind of fun. Um, this is the Francis Lawton Mobley papers, and in this letter that he was writing to his wife, he was trying to reassure her that he had never been in them bad houses, uh, that he would never do such a thing, that he was officer of the day, and he ran off some of those women from away from the troops, right? Um, really tender, uh, sweet, touching, funny um, correspondence uh, that gives you a window, even if this is, even if Francis Lawton Mobley isn't your ancestor, if he served in the same unit or served in a similar unit, it's a great way to get a window into what the experiences of your ancestors who served in the Civil War might have, have been through. Um, so that's one that I like to pull out. Um, this one I just find completely hilarious. Um, this is Abby Brooks. Uh, Abby Brooks was uh, born in Ohio. Um, in, I think, 1850, she had a child out of wedlock and her family kind of disowned her. So she ended up spending the rest of her life in the South working as a teacher, as a headmistress, I think, of her own school for a while. And for a while, she sold door-to-door -door, uh, magazine subscriptions and autographed pictures of Robert E. Lee. Um, go figure. Uh, but her diaries are really something else. And this is one that I like to pull out for teachers to illustrate that there's probably not a whole lot different in education over the past 150, 160 years. She says there seems to be a feeling of insubordination in school because she's too lenient. I dislike to govern a school more than any other duty which I have to perform. I feel perfectly prostrated. If I had trouble every day, I would have to stop teaching. Um, so really, really interesting stuff. Um, and then this is another uh, favorite of mine. Let me flip to this one really quick. Um, this is Carrie Berry. Uh, Carrie Berry was a 10-year-old girl in the summer of 1864, and she kept a diary. There's not a whole lot in each entry. She doesn't say a whole lot each day, but talk about a window into what that experience was like living in Atlanta during the campaign for Atlanta in the summer and early fall of 1864. So um, like I mentioned, these collections pertaining to the Civil War have all been digitized. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, this is the Carrie Berry diary. And I've got a little note here that the entry I wanted to show you was on page 12. So let me flip to that really quickly. And here it is down here at the bottom. So this is Wednesday. This was my birthday. I was 10 years old, but I did not have, but I did not have a cake. Times was too hard. So I celebrated it ironing. Uh, I hope by next birthday, we will have peace in our land so that I can have a nice dinner. Uh, the very next entry, she talks about the shells have been flying all day. And so we stayed in the cellar. Um, they're, they're amazing accounts of what life was like um, in the Civil War. So there's that. And those are all available online. And you can see the, um, the uh, images are just stunning. And, you know, you can download these, you can print these, you can, you know, do whatever you want to do with these as long as you, as you uh, credit the History Center for, for finding them. So they're, uh, they're beautiful records, very interesting and beautiful records. And then this one I wanted to share with you because this is just amazing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Emma a little bit later in the in the program. But uh, Emma Davis Hamilton is a, a partner of ours um, at the um, Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, uh, the Atlanta chapter. And she was in here doing some research on, I don't think he was an ancestor, but it was a, a, an enslaved individual for whom she was looking. These are our Lemuel P. Grant papers. And this particular ledger covers, you see the title up here, list of Negroes hired and impressed for work on the fortifications of Augusta. Uh, so this is September of 1864, this particular page. Um, and they were impressing these enslaved folks to do work on the uh, fortifications of Augusta. Uh, this is just after the Atlanta campaign. Um, so many of the pages look like this, but this is the one that I kind of wanted to show you because I just think it's uber cool. When you get over to a few pages further, let's see if I can, there we go. 
I'll move this up. Hopefully you can see this. Let me try to blow it up just a little bit. Can you see what's written in here? So this is still the list of enslaved folks, the name of the enslaved person, the name of the enslaver, and then supposedly the post office and county where they came from. But underneath here, the person has written run away on 9 December, run away on 10 December, run away on 9 December. Um, so I particularly love this record um, because it just demonstrates so clearly that um, these people took matters into their own hands and they they freed themselves. Um, you know, they they it's just amazing um, the resiliency. So that's a very cool record. And again, all available online. Images are beautiful, nice high res images that you can see quite clearly. Um, so those are some of the things, some of the manuscript collections that we have available online. We've got a great collection of photographs as well. Um, and this, these are just a few samples that I just kind of picked at random. They're ones that I kind of like. Um, if you're a, a military history fan and have ever seen the movie Band of Brothers, uh, this is Easy Company. These are soldiers from Easy Company when they trained here in Tacoa, Georgia. And that's their little mascot that they carried with them um, during some of their training. Uh, so that's kind of a fun image. Um, this one we always love. This is Solomon Lucky. Um, we believe that Solomon was a freed um, African-American man here in Atlanta who we know that he ran a barber shop in one of the hotels. We believe he was a, a, a freed uh, man. Um, and he was one of the most famous casualties of the campaign for Atlanta. He was standing outside a, a lamppost outside his barber shop and was hit by a shell. Um, and died uh, a short time later from his injuries. Um, in another, you know, they're all stories. Every photo has a story. So it's just amazing stuff. Uh, this is an image of the Weinkauf fire. That's a whole nother story I could tell you about. Um, on a lighter note, this is an 1895 football game between the University of Georgia and Auburn University. Longstanding rivalry there. And I love this image, uh, 1895. Um, this one, don't ask me how the dog got up there, but these fellows are trying to help him get down. Um, and then this one here, I just love, uh, don't you love the bathing suits? Uh, you know, what can you say about 19th, early 20th century bathing suits? They're just amazing. Uh, but this is an image from a really special collection that we recently acquired, um, thanks to our Cherokee Garden Library director. Um, and this is part of a collection um, that's called the um, Gardens and Cultural Landscapes of Black America, uh, visual arts materials. And these are beautiful, beautiful images um, that, dem that um, document landscapes and um, African-American life um, in the, the latter part of the 19th century and, and early to mid part of the 20th century. So again, wonderful materials that are available online. Um, for photographs, it's a little bit different. Our manuscript materials that are digitized, you're welcome to do with what you will. Um, photographs, we handle a little bit differently. There are licensing and permissions uh, to use them. There is a, uh, if it's available on album, there's a small charge to make reproductions for personal use. Um, quite frankly, we use that income to you know, purchase the preservation materials that we need to preserve these materials. So uh, photos are handled a little bit differently when it comes to reproductions um, than manuscript materials would be. But you can certainly reach out to me directly if you have questions about that. Um, so great images. And then um, wanted to spend at least a little time, I can't resist, with a, a captive audience. And I think there's multiple reasons for talking about this. We do have um, a number of really interesting oral history collections. Um, this one, this particular clip, and I'm not going to play the whole thing, um, and uh, uh, Sue, if you'll speak up if they can't hear this, I'm hoping they'll be able to hear this, uh, but this is Alice Adams. This is part of our Living Atlanta oral history collection. This is a, a series of interviews that were conducted to document uh, life in Atlanta in between the wars, so in between World War I and in between World War II. So amazing information in here um, about the 1906 race massacre, uh, about the civil rights movement in general. Um, but Alice Adams was a domestic with a wealthy family, and she talks in this interview about the fact that the streetcars that she rode home after her 12, 14-hour day, uh, that she wrote, rode home at the end of every day, that she, of course, was not permitted to sit next to um, folks that would have been her employers. So here's just a bit of that from that collection. And I never understood. Look, 
me going, you going in their house, cooking for them, making their beds, cleaning their house, doing everything. And then you uh, couldn't sit by them. But you could go there and cook their food, serve their food, but still you couldn't sit by them. This is what I never could understand. Why is it you can eat my food? Now, I don't mean my peoples were that prejudiced because they were very nice, but they had to be with the peoples, you understand? And so, <laughs> plainly speaking, they had to be with the peoples. They was Catholic and they was very nice. They, they didn't believe in this, but they had to be with the peoples. Now, you cooking and serving their food, handling their food, but yet you can't sit by them. You go in their house and clean their house and they say how beautiful it was clean. You are uh, a number one domestic housekeeper, and but yet you couldn't sit by them. You had to stand. Um, and then this, I, I, I can't do a presentation without speaking about the Veterans History Project. Um, and when it comes to genealogical and, and family history research, let me just mention this. Um, I'm a Navy wife, a Air Force daughter, and an Army granddaughter. Um, none of my three guys ever talked about what they did in the military. Um, almost none at all. And for all of them, it was, you know, I, I didn't do anything. Well, the truth of it is they did do things, but everything I know about their service, I found out after they passed away. So Veterans History Project for me, this is a nationwide project. We've been collecting since 1995, but the Library of Congress with whom we partner started collecting in 2000. And so what I found over the years, you know, maybe your ancestor who served in World War II, maybe you never got a, an interview of him or her either, like I didn't. But if you know what unit they served in, you can probably find someone from the same unit who was interviewed, who can give you a firsthand perspective on what that experience was like. And these went, men and women talk about their friends. They talk about the people particularly that they lost. So if you have an ancestor who was killed in any of these conflicts, you may want to be looking for an interview from someone who served in the same unit because you'd be amazed at some of the things that you can learn. Um, so this is just a quick clip, and I'm sorry, I can't resist playing this too. This is um, actually Charles Dryden, who is the real deal. Um, Colonel Dryden was one of the Tuskegee Airmen, and most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, with them and with what they did. And I love this story um, that he tells um, about an encounter that he had many years after the war. So I'll go ahead and play that. Well, I was sitting at the desk. This guy came, he's a white guy, and he came up, he had an Air Force cap on. He looked as old as I did. <laughs> And he asked me, were you in that outfit? And I said, yes, I was. The guy started to cry. The tears were coming out of his eyes. And he related to me how on a mission to Vienna, his airplane had been shot up. They were straggling. They couldn't keep up with the formation. And the pilot of the airplane was calling Mayday. SOS help, we need help. And uh, an officer with the Red Tails, Tuskegee Airmen, in the area, two of them came over and sat in on each side of him and escorted him all the way back home safely. And he went on to say, if it hadn't been for you guys, I wouldn't be sitting here. He said, because we'd have been shot down for sure. And as a result of you having gotten us home safely, I've had children and grandchildren. And if it hadn't been for you, I rather, my family owes you men our past, our present, and our future. Well, I started to cry. <laughs> Such a great, great um, inter interview. The whole interview is amazing. So um, the uh, last couple things that I wanted to mention as far as online content, we do have a couple of online exhibitions uh, that you might be interested in. I'm just going to point these out really quickly. 
Um, this is more than self living the Vietnam War. This is an online exhibit that contains a lot of the uh, photographs and artifacts um, and oral history interviews, of course, um, pertaining to um, Vietnam. Um, and these are all taken from our collections. Um, this fellow right here talks a little bit about what it was like um, when he first landed in Vietnam. Um, uh, let me look at my time. I think I'm okay playing this. Let me play this right, right quick. But then we stopped in Hawaii, we stopped in Guam and Clark, Air Force Base, Philippines, and landed uh, in Benoit about midday. Uh, and uh, reality sets in real quick. What's your uh, first recollection of arrival? When they opened the doors on the plane, it was, you know, I left home, it was 30 degrees. Uh, they opened the door and it was 110. And the heat just took my breath away. Uh, and as, as going across the tarmac there, I looked over and it was an Air Force uh, C-141 Starlifter. And they were loading coffins and body bags on board. And that is when reality hit right there. So you got some great content um, there. Uh, let me see if I can find my, sorry, my presentation again. Um, and then Veteran Voices, um, this is a, an ongoing collection. Um, we're, we're populating this website with new content all the time. Um, and it's kind of divided into the, the themes that we tend to hear in veteran interviews. Um, and you've got a wide variety of content here. Um, Homefront, uh, this is a great Rosie the Riveter interview. Um, but if you click on, you know, hear more veteran voices, it takes you to our YouTube channel where you've got these playlists. Um, there's folks that talk about 9-11. There's folks that talk about uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, I've got a, a, a wife of a, a POW fellow that uh, spent three months in the Hanoi Hilton. So there's a lot of really good uh, content there as well. Um, so that's a little bit about what the Atlanta History Center has that can help you with your family history research. But I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of how else you can do uh, Georgia research, research in the South online. And forgive me if, if you guys are all well aware of this stuff. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Um, if there's time after the presentation, I'm more than happy to go onto these websites and show you more. But just wanted to make sure that you're aware of this because I'm always impressed by how few people know about some of these resources. You know, you think that, that they do and they don't. Um, the Family Search Wiki is a, an, a fantastic resource. resource. Uh, the last genealogy conference I attended, they talked about this new guided research feature. Um, for example, if you've got people in Russia and you don't know anything about Russia or Belarus or, you know, uh, Czech Republic, you know, wherever, um, you can click on this guided research button and it'll kind of walk you through some of the steps that you should take doing your due diligence uh, to look for the records in whatever locality that might be. Um, I recently broke across a brick wall on my dad's line uh, in Germany. And when I first started reading that German script, and those of you who have German ancestors, you know what I mean, I cried. Um, but there you type in German handwriting and there's tutorials there on how to decipher it, tutorials on what words you should be looking for in German that are genealogical words, family history related words. Um, can't say enough about the wiki. The wiki is an amazing resource for conducting um, all kinds of research. Wanted to make sure that you're not neglecting the family search catalog. So the catalog is important for a number of reasons. Number one, um, if in this country, typically, and really this kind of goes for every country, the, the civil unit is just might just be a little bit different. But in this country, genealogical records tend to be held at the county level. Um, so you can search for, you know, Henry County, Georgia genealogy, and it'll list all of the resources that Family Search has compiled, both online and at their library in Salt Lake. And then if it turns out that it's not digitized and it is at their library in Salt Lake, you can use WorldCat over here at the right to see if you can find a copy closer to home. So make sure you're looking at the Family Search catalog. I can't tell you how many times that has helped me out. Um, that's a huge online resource that I think a lot of people neglect. 
Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention is Roots Tech. And if you've never made friends with Roots Tech, you need to make friends with Roots Tech. Um, last count, there are 4,332 videos available on the Roots Tech website for on-demand viewing. And these are conference sessions. Um, if you've never been to a genealogy conference, I highly recommend you do so. Um, but these are conference sessions that have been recorded. They're available for free. And there's stuff, every geographic area in the world is covered, every language. In fact, some of these sec sessions are actually recorded. I was looking in, uh, in uh, Asia, some Asian um, uh, presentations, and some of them were actually recorded and had subtitles in Thai, you know, so it's, it's an amazing resource. Make sure that you make friends uh, with Roots Tech because there's an awful lot of great content there. And then for sort of more Georgia specific stuff, uh, the Georgia Archives has a fantastic website. And again, I'm happy to test drive some of these websites when I finish the presentation, if you'd like me to. Um, they've got wonderful information online. They have a virtual uh, virtual component here uh, with um, digitized versions of uh, death records with of you know all manner of stuff and this dates back to the colonial period in Georgia's history so what I always tell my my uh, genealogy workshop participants you've got to think about who created the record and why so anything that was created as part of the state of Georgia um, from colonial times to the present if if it's a, a George if it if the jurisdiction falls under the state of Georgia or the colony of Georgia or Georgia as part of the Confederate States of America, you're going to find it at the Georgia archives. And they've got wonderful um, materials available online, in addition to a really nice little website about caring for your records. So if you've got questions about how you should be taking care of your photos or your rare books that you might maybe have, um, that's a great resource to use. If you have African American ancestry, I would highly recommend the Atlanta chapter, and I would highly recommend thinking about that no matter where your ancestors are. I can't tell you how much success I've had and how many brick walls I've broken down because I, I went and kind of made friends with the people running those local genealogical societies, the local genealogy and historical societies in the areas where your ancestors lived. Um, OGS, that's kind of what we call them for short, OGS. Um, does amazing work um, here in the Atlanta area. They're not expensive to join, um, and that can be a huge help. Um, if for no other reason than you're, you're, you're meeting other people who are doing the same kind of research that you are, and that can be really helpful to you. You can bounce ideas back and forth. Uh, there's a lot of folks in that organization that have been researching a lot longer than I have. You know, they would be great sources of information for how to find things and how to do things, regardless of where your ancestors actually ended up um, coming from or living. And on the same note, the Georgia Genealogical Society. Um, so these two organizations, I would highly recommend thinking about joining if that fits with your family history. Um, but going local is always hugely helpful um, for that. And then this book um, is really helpful too. So if you're if you have ancestors in Georgia, you may want to think about picking up a copy. Um, or you can go to WorldCat and find out what library close to you might maybe have a copy of this book. Um, but this is a good resource for answering a lot of those questions. You know, those of you who are doing any kind of research in the South, there's always the, you know, Sherman burned the county records, right? We hear that all the time, the burn counties, you know, either Sherman burned them or, you know, the courthouse burned down and everything's gone. Well, in some cases, that's the case. But in other cases, that's not the whole story. And a book like this is helpful going county by county and kind of explaining when did the records begin in that county? What's still available? Were there burn issues? If there were burn issues, what are the workarounds? Because there's always a workaround um, in some form or fashion. You may never find the exact records you're looking for, but there's usually a way um, to find something that is, is helpful at least, even if it doesn't fully answer your question. Uh, so there's that. And then finally, I just kind of wanted to mention, you know, if you can get to Atlanta, come see us. 
um, we're free, free Wi-Fi, free parking, um, the museum, there's of course a charge for the museum, but the, the Keenan Research Center is free, and we do provide our on-site uh, patrons with free access to Ancestry and Full3 and newspapers.com, because as we all know, those are, are hugely helpful. Um, some of the materials that we have that have not been digitized that can still be helpful, we've got subject files and genealogy subject files. We've got folks that have excuse me, done their family history or done a portion of their family history and then donated those records to us. Just as an illustration, this is my great uncle. I didn't think I had any contact or any connections with Atlanta at all. I'm from California. Um, but lo and behold, he actually taught uh, ROTC for Georgia Tech. And somebody got wind of the fact that he was a Corregidor survivor in World War II and they sent a newspaper reporter out. And I got this full page article all about his experience. So you never know what you're gonna find. This one I just stuck in here for free, for fun. Uh, another one I trot out for the teachers. Um, President Taft, uh, right after he was elected, he came here uh, before he was inaugurated for a big chamber of commerce dinner. And what did they decide to feed the president elect but barbecued opossum with persimmon sauce. So all kinds of fun stuff in our subject files. We've got a huge map collection. This is an area not far from the History Center in 1933. This is the same area in 1872. Those of you who've worked with maps know that maps can be hugely helpful, both in 1933 and in 1872. You've got the original owners of the parcel. Uh, this, of course, uh, was Creek land that was uh, stolen from the Creeks. Um, but you can find all kinds of information about the land lottery system here in Georgia and how that worked um, as well. Uh, we've got a huge collection of materials in our reading room. Uh, we've got about 6,000 volumes in our genealogy library. We collect a little more broadly for genealogy because unless you're uh, indigenous Native American, you came to Atlanta from somewhere else. So we do collect for the original 13 colonies and then all of the southeastern states. And we've got a respectable collection for pretty much every one of the 159 counties um, in Georgia. So it's a, it's a good collection of books. Rare books can be huge. Um, I've selected this one mostly because this is a uh, Illinois Civil War, Illinois unit, and you see the publishing date. Um, this is a history of that regiment that was published essentially before the Civil War was over. Uh, so there's some great rare books in our collection, too, that can be very helpful as well. Uh, that's just a view from our reading room. Our Cherokee Garden Library has great information on uh, uh, landscape and design and historic landscaping and historic burial practices. There's some great books in there on cemeteries um, in Georgia and what burial practices were like in the South. So. Uh, good stuff there. Uh, we do have quite a lot of microfilm. Um, chief among that is our city directory collection, but you can get these now on Ancestry. Um, just know that uh, our city directories are reverse lookup directories. So beginning in the 1880s, uh, you can not only look up someone by their name, but you can look on a street and find out who lived at uh, 1432 Peachtree Street in 1897. You can find out who lived there. You can find out their race, their occupation, their wife's name. Um, this is Dr. King's uh, parents in the 1930 directory. Um, so city directories can be really helpful. Um, these are marriage records and death records, but of course the Georgia Archives now has these available online. So these aren't um, most people don't use our microphone for that because you can get those online. Um, and then finally, I do do programming. Um, and I'm going to drop into the chat. Let me go back during the pandemic. Um, we wanted to do a Juneteenth program. Hang on, I got to think for a minute where to find this. Um, we wanted to do a Juneteenth program on African American research. And of course, we couldn't meet in person. So Emma Davis Hamilton, my lovely contact at the um, at OGS at the Afro American Historical and Genealogical Society, agreed to do an online presentation. And I'm going to drop a chat a link to this in the chat. So this, um, of course, is free and accessible. Um, this is all about the Freedmen's Bureau. So Emma did a great program for us. 
on the Freedmen's Bureau, and I'll put that in the chat there. So that's available. Okay, and then finally, just a couple of things to entice you to come to Atlanta. If you come here, you get to see the Cyclorama, which is one of only two such paintings in America. One's in Gettysburg, one's here. 132 years old, 10,000 pounds. It's 49 feet tall and longer than a football field. And it covers a moment in time during the campaign for Atlanta. Very impressive, very cool. Um, we have a working farm with goats that are amazing. Uh, this is Brett Banner, um, our uh, our livestock uh, man. He's amazing, takes care of our, our sheep and goats and chickens. Uh, we've got some wonderful exhibits with a lot of great interactives for kids. It's an amazing museum. Um, if you're a Hunger Games fan, this is the Swan House made famous as President Snow's mansion in the Hunger Games movies and our Hudson vehicle. Um, you'd never know that you were in the middle of the largest city in the southeast. Uh, we have 33 acres, and this is just a piece of it with our Wood family cabin. And then finally, uh, this is our Veterans Park. Um, every year at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, we have a Veterans Day program scattered throughout this park, which is dedicated to our veterans, our interpretive panels with QR codes that you can delve into our oral history collection of our veterans. So um, that is pretty much what I wanted to share with you. Let me turn my camera back on and stop sharing for a minute so I'm not so distracted. What can I tell you? Okay, I'll open it up to the class. Uh, if you have a question for our guest speaker, if you could unmute your microphone, ask the question, and then please mute it again. While I'm waiting for questions to come in, Sue, you had mentioned that you would go over the Georgia Archives website for us? Yes, let me do that. I've got a question. Yes. Um, I've, um, I signed up for the uh, Veterans History Project and I've got everything together. And I've gone to both the uh, VA hospital and also the American Legion. But so far I haven't gotten anybody that's been interested in doing the uh, oral history project. Any suggestions? Send me an email and I'll find somebody where you are. I'm happy. Well, no, I mean, I can't. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because yeah. I, I can do it and I'm ready to do it. Um, I just haven't found any takers yet. And I, I totally get that. Um, I was talking to somebody just the other day. That's been kind of a source of frustration. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project dates back to 2000. At that time, everybody jumped on the bandwagon because everybody wanted to do that work. You know, wonderful work. They wanted to be able to collect these stories. But over time, a lot of that has kind of, a lot of them have dropped off. And sometimes it's kind of hard to figure out who is still collecting and who isn't. But I promise you that we can find someone, uh, hopefully not too far from where you live. So shoot me an email. Um, Sue, I think I sent you our brochures, uh, the handouts. Yeah, everyone okay. got it. Yeah, I sent it to everybody. Okay. Perfect. That Veterans History Project brochure has my name, my, my telephone number, and my email on the back of it. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email and just tell me where, you know, where you live and I will do all I can to find someone who's collecting nearby so we can get that done. And I'm sorry that you, you haven't gotten the response that you should have, but we'll find someone. Well, I'm, I'm one of the ones doing the collecting and I haven't found anybody that wanted uh, to be interviewed. Well, I would plug into your local veterans organizations. Are you a member of the VFW or the American Legion? there yeah i am a member of american legion i brought it up to them i retired from the uh, uh va hospital here in reno and i've reached out to them and uh, got a lot of it sounds good but i uh, haven't gotten any takers as yet oh. and then i have one other i have one other question for you um i'm also involved in the uh, sons of union veterans of the civil war uh-huh and uh, is there any interest in oral history from any of the people there about their relatives? Um, you know, we've, we have a number of oral history collection, oral history projects in the collection. Um, nothing pertaining to that. 
Um, you know, but that that certainly isn't to say that there wouldn't be an interest, you know, among that organization. So you may want to, you know, chat with with your folks, um, you know, to see if they might maybe be interested in doing that. Um, if you want to start your own project, and and you know, I would say for veterans history as well, um, I can certainly point you in the right direction for kind of how to go about doing that. Um, there, there's a lot of ethics involved. There's a lot of legalities involved, uh, but I can point you to some really good websites uh, that kind of cover how to go about crafting a project. Um, you know, what you need to take into consideration, what you want to keep in mind from the very beginning, what questions that you want to ask yourselves uh, before you get started on that. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email and put all that in it. And I'm happy to, to share whatever I can with you to get that off the ground. All right, thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, maybe it's time that we look at the uh, the uh, Georgia archives. Okie doke. Um, can I interrupt real quick? I'm sorry, I had to. Sure. My computer. My name is Catherine. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, my husband's side of the family had a relative in Ware County. He ended up <laughs> uh, volunteering his services in the Civil War, although he was uh, a Jewish man from Prussia. You know, you just uh, end up doing what you have to do. And when I went to look for records for Ware County, I understand the courthouse had burned for the county. Um, what is the workaround for that? Well, you know, I kind of need to go to that Georgia research book or to the wiki. Let me just show you. We'll put, put a little bit of this before we get into the Georgia archives. Let's do a little bit of this. Um, I'm not familiar, too familiar, and pardon me. See, now you're going to get the Mr. Magoo thing because I've got my camera on, right? Um, let's do this. That's what we all do, though. <laughs> oh, it's just so obnoxious. My boss says I look like I'm drunk. Um, Georgia, where? Here we go. So this is what I would do, is start right here. And I would also start here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Everybody's on family search right now, right? <laughs> Okay. Have you tried this page before? Um, I may have. It's been quite a long time since I worked on this uh, Davidson line. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it does say 1874, Waycross. Uh, almost all county records were lost. Uh, research in places that suffered historic record losses. You can look at these books. Um. And I, I've heard of this gal. This might not be a bad a bad place to do a bad place to go. And then, of course, you've got Burn County's research in on the Family Search Wiki. Um, so here's some great strategies. And and you know, um, okay. I would kind of do the same thing that I mentioned as far as um, and we can just do this right now too. Let's do. Um, Ware County, Georgia, Genealogical Society. Figure out who's there. Okay, there's a family search art, uh, article. Um, random acts. Yeah, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing a a society, but this is kind of you know, and again, that this can take you back to the wiki, which is where we were before. Okay. Um, you know, kind of look and see who's there, if there's anybody on the ground. The other thing that you can do is look and see if there's a family search center um, anywhere in Way County, Ware County. And given the fact that it looks like Waycross, I, I guarantee you there's a family search center in Waycross. Yes. Okay. okay. So, re, you know, yeah, reach out to them and just see because, you know, theoretically they're staffed by volunteers. And so I will tell you sometimes the level of expertise um, varies widely. 
you know, because they're volunteers, but they're there and they may be able to tell you, you know, yeah, the courthouse burned in 1874, but, you know, there's a funeral home in town that still has records or, you know, there's a, a cemetery that's still functioning and they've got some records. Um, again, kind of finding that local uh, that local thing is is great. Okay. Uh, but this is where county, this is what Family Search has. And and what were you hoping to find specifically? You know, I just I wanted to know if there is there is more than what I have found. I have used the um, family search. I do use ancestry. Um, I have tacked on to other family members and then researched what they had in um, both family search and ancestry. So I will look at this again. You know, it's just another line and just want to ask that question because you said the Atlanta um, Center that you work with has um, some information for even counties that may have burned. So yeah, I would definitely, you know, each one of these is gonna is gonna split out, right? I would click through all of these links and see what's available if there's anything in the catalog that might be helpful to you. Yes. Um, and you know, see what's there. But it sounds to me like you're doing the right things. Um, another thing I can tell you, just because you don't find it on Family Search or Ancestry today doesn't mean it won't be there tomorrow. Um, you know, both of those organizations are putting records up all the time. Um, so, you know, keep at it because there, you know, there may be, um, there may be things that have yet to be digitized. Yes. Um, yeah. Does that Thank help you. a little bit? Yeah, you're wonderful. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Anything else before we look at Georgia Archives? Well, just real quickly, so here's their virtual vault. Um, they do have a book and manuscript catalog as well. Um, the virtual vault will kind of tell you the types of materials that they've got, um, you know, recorded property transactions back in colonial time. These are colonial plats and warrants. These are colonial wills. Um, you know, they've got some fabulous stuff here. And this is just, just quickly clicking through um, their virtual vault. Um, I haven't been here in a while, um, but yeah, marriage records from microfilm. Um, you know, you can go to any, can, let's look at where, let's see if there's anything here for where. Yep, no, you know, it looks like this all post dates the fire naturally is why is that always the case? Um, but you know, you've got some records at least from 1874 um, that might maybe be helpful. Um, so, yeah. Um, so there's that. And then, of course, um, their main website. Okay, let's see, I'm back on the virtual vault. Let me get back here to their main website. Here's the part about caring for records. You know, how do you handle books, documents, photographic images? You know, um, where can I get storage su supplies? You know, disaster preparedness. There's just, just such great stuff here. Um, you can search their collections. Um, they do do. Um, workshops um quite frequently but i don't think they put theirs online that's i'm not sure uh, let me just look and see yeah it doesn't look like they they put them you know their workshops online but just know the georgia archives is a great place to go it's a great place to explore online and see what maybe they might have um, the other thing you might want to keep in mind when we're talking about the Georgia Genealogical Society, if you go here to their research tab, there is a researchers for hire. Um, you know, they can't recommend any of these folks specifically, but if you're looking for something real specific, it might be worth it for you to hire somebody and tell them. Georgia Archives has this book, you know, it's not available. You know, I, I just, can you look at the index and tell me if my surname is there? Um, but I'll also tell you that most repositories, certainly the Atlanta History Center, if you've got a very specific question, we will do everything that we can to answer your query online. Um, what you don't want to do is send me a three-page email all about your family history. Um, and, I, and I don't mean to be to sound rude or ugly when I say that, but most of these repositories struggle with not enough staff. Um, and the staff never have enough time to do all the things that we'd like to do. So if you can be very succinct, um, for example, um, you know, our Garrett's Necrology is available online now. So this isn't, you know, you wouldn't need to do that now. But, you know, if we had a collection, if we had um, 
uh, you know, um, a collection of civil rights area material that hadn't been digitized yet. You know, can you look in this collection, MSS, you know, 974, it looks like my ancestor might maybe be in box five, folder seven, but I'm not sure. Would you mind going to box five, folder seven, and just see if my ancestor is mentioned in those documents? A very small, manageable um, question like that. Most places are just more than happy to do that. And boy, if you can follow it up with a thank you um, and, you know, maybe a, a $20 donation. Um, I broke through a brick wall doing that with the Orange County Genealogical Society up in New York. Um, I said, you know, this is my ancestor's name. I think he might have been married there between 1850 and 1855. Can you tell me if you've got any records? And I got back the marriage record. Um, so I sent them money. I, you know, it, it, you you all know, you know, it's when you find something, you know, it's worth it. And many of these smaller historical societies in particular really struggle with funding and staffing. And anything that you can do to help them in that regard would be much appreciated. Um, well, while we're waiting for a question to come in, I do have kind of a librarian question. Sure. Um, your Civil War collection, um, because so many uh, people come to our library researching their Civil War ancestors. I'm always interested in how did you obtain all the materials for that collection? Were these all donations by local families? Yes, almost exclusively donations. Um, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've we've got a little bit of funding. We've been doing some purchasing of um, uh, USCT materials. Those of you that are, are Civil War fans, you'll know that stands for United States Colored Troops. Um, we've got some amazing artifacts uh, that we've been able to acquire that way. But but the bulk of our collection from the very beginning, uh, the History Center has been around since 1926, and the bulk of our collections are all donations. Um, and, it, and it's amazing stuff. And I will tell you, we get patrons, walk-in patrons, they're visiting Atlanta for a conference or a convention, or they're just here on vacation and they'll walk in and say, you know, I had an ancestor who was killed at Kennesaw Mountain. Can you tell me where he's buried? Well, probably not. You know, um, a lot of folks want to know that, uh, you know, in some cases you've got a burial site, but in many cases you don't. Um, in Civil War records, that's a whole nother uh, can of worms, depending on whether you're looking for Union records or Confederate records, that makes a big difference as well. But we do have some really interesting stuff. We've got, um, you know, Oakland Cemetery. There's a a, a a ton of Confederate burials, and you know, we've got a, a list of those. You know, there's 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 interesting records. There's interesting, and again, it's going local. It's you know, finding the local place and what records still exist there, and you know, how can you find them. So that's a good question. A couple of good books out there on conducting research for Civil War ancestors. So, And which ones would you recommend? And yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that because the titles have both just gone. Um, darn, darn, darn. Hold on. Am I still sharing my screen? Let me stop sharing. Yes. So you can't see all my dirty laundry. But let me look through while you're, if there's other questions, please feel free to ask them. I think I can put my hands on this quickly, but it'll take me a sec. I'm figuring one of them is probably the William Dollar Hyde book. Let me look. Okay, here's my top sheets. No, that would be it. The name escapes me. I'm sure you probably know what it is. Yeah, uh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce his name. It's a Dutch name too. Gruna, Bertram Gruna, Tracing Your Civil War Ancestor. Yeah. This one. Okay, I'm gonna write that one down. If you could leave it up for a second. Yep, that's kind of my go-to. Um, are you familiar with the soldiers, the NPS soldiers and sailors? I've never had anyone ask about it. Okay. So this is a National Park Service website, but this is based on compiled records that they, um, the, Nash, the um, National Archives essentially just kind of opened their doors, right? Um, so this is the uh, soldiers and sailors. So give me, who are you looking for, Sue? Do you have a, do you have somebody? Um, I can just give you one of my ancestors. Uh, his name okay. was Alonzo Bartlett. All right. 
Armando? No, our, uh, Alonzo. A -L -O -N. Alonzo, sorry. Alonzo. Oh, that's a nice, unusual name. He served in uh, New York. Do you have a middle initial? Um, I believe it was B, but I may be wrong. Do you know the regiment? Uh, yes, I do. If you give me one second, uh, I will look it up for you. Hold on. 35th, maybe? Uh, hold on, I'm looking it up now. No worries. Uh, he served uh, New York, 35th. Yep, here he is. Um, so this is the microfilm at the National Archives where um, this exists. Now, now Ancestry probably has, or Fold3, um, probably has way more. Hang on, let me, let's do this real quick. That's not what I wanted. Here we go. Okay. About 1831, maybe? For a birth year? Yeah, here he is right here. Well, this would be my guess. Maybe not, but it is 35th Infantry. Yeah, that's probably him. Yeah. Yeah, Watertown. That's where, yep. Yeah. That's him. Yep. So you got a little bit of information there. Ancestry is a real good, real good resource for that. Um, you also want to make sure that you're looking for him in the... Um, in any pension records. If he survived the war, or even if he didn't, uh, widow's pensions. Um, so yeah, Ancestry ha is, ha is a great resource. So is Fold3, but I will tell you, Fold3, it, I have find it a little difficult to navigate. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but I, it just is. So what else? Um, you had mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are ways to dig down in family search for non-indexed records. Do you mind touching on that a little bit? Yes, you certainly can. So let's go back here. This is the way that I usually find it. You can get there a million different ways, but I just go down here to the find a collection and I just type in Fulton because much of Atlanta is in Fulton County and see the drop down is Georgia Fulton County records. And that takes you to the main landing page. And if you don't know this anyway, this is good for any record group that you're working with in Ancestry, anything that's not been fully um, indexed. You see where it says browse all 35,000 records? Um, you know, you look at that and it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. Well, yeah, you do. And this is why. So if I go to browse all 35,000 records, I've got this wonderful waypointing, which makes a big difference in how much work this ends up being. So for example, um, I know that not all the, um, well, let's see, what did we say? The court of ordinary records aren't indexed. Um, maybe not all the census, well, let's click on census and see. Um, Okay, yeah, like I said, it's broken down there with the, the different wards that you can go to. So the census records are indexed. So I could use the main search page to be able to type in my name and all that stuff. But again, you also want to remember, with these are typed records, so it's not so bad. But anytime you're working with uh, handwritten records, sometimes you can look forever for somebody and not find them because somebody indexed it wrong. So it helps to know kind of how to navigate these records so that you can do that 20th century version of, um, let me go to, let me do the vital records sort of the 21st century version of scrolling through the old microfilm. So um, for example, if this record group was not indexed, 
you'd kind of have to know a rough date when your ancestor might have died. But if you've, you know, even if you've only got, you know, this, there's only three volumes to go through for the whole year. Well, three and a half, I guess, for the whole year of 1925. So, you know, if I, if I knew he died in 1925, but I wasn't really sure when, I've only got 49 images to go through for this first group. And I'd have to do that again for subsequent groups. But, you know, you can still do that. And once you kind of get the lay of the land, um, you know, you can skip forward. So we know that this is from uh, September of 24 to January of 25. If I know I'm looking for January, I don't have to go through 49 images. I can just type 45 in here and see where that takes me. So these are deaths on 18th, the 18th of January, right? Or yeah, he put 24, but he meant 25. Um, so I'm in January without having to scroll through all those things. Um, so it's pretty easy. They make it as easy as they can with this waypointing um, for you to kind of find out where you want to go. Um, if I was looking for, you know, guardians bonds, you've got between 1839 and 1856. Well, I got 300 images for that, you know, roughly 20 year time span. If I'm looking for 1849, well, then maybe I want to start with, you know, image 150. And then when you get there, you can kind of, oh boy, what a mess, huh? Don't you love it when the ink bleeds through? Um, but you see what I'm saying? There's, there's ways to kind of quickly scroll through these records once you kind of get a grip. And if these have an index at the beginning of the volume, which I didn't bother to look for, but that's probably the first thing that you want to do. You want to scroll through and see if there's a page that you can um, directly go to. Okay, yeah, it looks like these. this does not have an index to it. Um, you might also want to look at the back of the book and see if there's an index at the very end. Um, but it doesn't look like there is. But you know what I'm saying. If there was an index at the beginning that was alphabetical that might tell you what page it's on, you know, then you know now this is page 311, but it's image 332. And that's because there's several pages at the beginning of this book. <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> that don't have content on it. Does that make sense? Have I gone through that too fast? No, 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 I think okay. this is a great lesson for all of us. Okay, so uh, class, do you have any other questions? We'll give it a few seconds. And while we're waiting for any more questions to come in, uh, is there a typical genealogy question that you get on a you know regular basis? Um, you know, it depends on the on the program. I've got a couple dozen different programs that I do. It kind of depends on the topic. Um, you know, what we're talking about um, with military records. You know, the, the first question I always get is what about the fire? Um, I don't know if you, if any of you were doing military research, there was a 1973 fire at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis that destroyed 80% of all army records. You think about that for a minute. Um, but there's hope there, um, which I'm always happy to give. So if you have questions about that, send me an email. Um, if I, if it's cemetery records, you know, the, the big question there usually is, you know, well, what if the cemetery is not no longer functioning, you know, how can I get information on a cemetery where there's no, there's no active office anymore? Um, if it's, uh, uh, I do a, I do a real fun program about traveling, um, to, to do on-site research. Um, you know, people have a lot of questions about that, you know, how do you plan to do that? And, you know, how does that work? Um, so it kind of depends on the topic. Civil War, the, the, usually the biggest one for Civil War is my ancestor, you know, died in Atlanta. Where is he buried? Uh, um, you know, it, it could be in someone's garden. I mean, it's, you know, in so many cases, they were buried where they fell. Um, you know, we've got beautiful cemeteries like, like the cemetery in Marietta, the National Cemetery in Marietta. It's very well cared for. It's a beautiful cemetery, and those graves graves are very well documented. But there are other, um, you know, cemeteries around and and unknown burial places. Um, so yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, give the class a few more seconds to see if there's any last minute questions. Don't hesitate to send me an email. You know, sometimes you're, it's awkward to ask a question in a 
setting like this. But if you've got questions about Georgia research or anything that I've covered in the presentation, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer anything you've got if I can. Wonderful. Okay. Well, before we say goodbye, um, I got a few things I want to just cover real quickly. Uh, first, uh, of course, thank you very much, Sue, for your time and your expertise. Um, I'd like to kind of invite you back if you are open to that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, excellent. excellent. Okay, super. Then I'll, I'll follow up with you in an email afterwards. Um, also, uh, there for the people who are new today, and like I said, I see at least one new name here on the screen. Uh, the class is actually divided into two parts. Uh, after our guest speaker is done, uh, we go on with the class for several more hours. Uh, if you'd like to stay, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and if you'd like to leave uh, at this point in time, uh, I want to let you know that uh, if you are going to leave, please, if there's anything in the chat box that you want, uh, download the chat box before you leave. Uh, because if you forget and then you log back in, you will not see the content of the chat box. Uh, so with that, Sue, I'll say thank you very much. Uh, once again, we really appreciate your time and expertise. And we also appreciate uh, the fact that you had so many nice handouts and that you allowed us to record. So that's very, very much appreciated. Thank you so much. And I want to do a quick shout out to Paula in the chat. That is an example of random acts of genealogical kindness. So thank you all for taking care of each other. Um, she mentioned that if somebody was looking for Ware County, she lives in Northeast Florida, and maybe she could nip up there and do that. So, you know, that's that's what makes the world go around. Thank you. Oh, and Catherine, if you haven't seen Paula's uh, mention about that in chat, please do. Okay, so with that, we're going to uh, stop the recording and see once again, thank you so much. We really deeply appreciate it. Thank you again, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye.